we we started the discussion a little bit about some of the public sector stuff um, a few months ago, a few weeks ago. Can't even remember now. Time is passing. Uh, with 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 Bruce, and uh, thankfully he's uh, he's come back to to have another discussion with us today about some of the differences between public sector and private sector. And I'm really excited about this discussion. So again, Bruce, thank you very much for your time and for 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 your interest and your your enthusiasm and your passion. So today's discussion is going to be a very entry level discussion about the difference between accounting in the private sector, which is predominantly IFRA space. So we're going to sort of talk about private sector IFRA space and the public sector, which has its own set of standards. <laughs> and I, I, I'm not going to assume, in fact, I am going to assume that most people that have never had anything to do with the public sector are actually possibly not aware that these things exist. I think we're so used to sort of going, when you do accounting stuff, you use EFRAS, that there's a large percentage of people and students and, and you know, people out there at whatever levels that are not aware of the fact that the public sector has its actual own set of financial statements, I mean, you know, accounting standards, which is quite fascinating. So we're going to talk about the differences between these, why they exist, um, and they're not intended to be for someone at a level who's got, you know, massive expertise in EFRAS. So, you know, if you're studying accounting, if you're working in accounting, if you don't have detailed knowledge of EFRAS, that's completely fine. Um, this discussion, you're still going to get a lot of value. And I think you're going to find it really interesting to understand, you know, and as a result of the sort of understand how the sectors work, you know, their differences, what they're doing, what they're not doing. So <clears throat> super excited to have this discussion. Again, thank you very much for your time, Bruce. Um, so our, our starting point, I think, is um, why would the public sector have its own set of standards? Okay, first of all, what are they? And why would they need their own set of standards? Why isn't EFRS just perfect? Like, why isn't EFRS good enough? Yeah. So, yeah, hi, everyone. And, and uh, it's a good starting point. Um, let's start off with what the standards are. Yeah. So, in, in South Africa, uh, we have a couple of different reporting frameworks that are used in government. Uh, one called GRAP, which is generally recognized accounting practice. Uh, and another called the modified cash basis, modified cash standards. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail on that yeah. one, although I'll mention it a bit later. Yeah. But GRAP um, is, is part of a family of, of accounting standards globally that actually fall under uh, what we call IPSAS, the International Public Sector Accounting Standards. Right. Uh, and it's one of those moments where we can be quite proud as South Africans because uh, we're, we're very much a leader uh, in, in accounting standards for the public sector globally. So the work that's done by the IPSAS B, which is the, the board that, that produces IPSAS, um, takes a lot of guidance, a lot of uh, inspiration from the work of, of oh, okay. uh, accounting standards board in South Africa that sets GRAP. Um, but, but, but overall, I think, you know, globally, you wouldn't hear of GRAP, you'd hear of IPSAS. Uh, yeah. and, and the basic idea here is that it's not, a lot of people think, you know, oh, it's public sector, so it must be dumbed down or simplified or something like that. And that's not the case at all. It's, it, it's, a, it's because uh, in the public sector, we have like a fundamental difference between, between why the entities exist, yeah. right? Yeah. In, in the private sector, it's all about making money. It's all about the bottom line for profit and, you know. Whereas in, in government, it's all about uh, service delivery. It's yeah. all about, you know, did you use the money for the intended purpose? I, I paid you my taxpayer's money. Did you, did, did you use it to deliver services? Or, you know, I'm not checking whether you made money out of my money. I'm checking yes. whether I got clean drinking water and whether I got, you know, a road built and things like that. Yeah. Uh, so, so fundamentally, the, 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 the reason why we are reporting is different. And, and often mm. in accounting, we don't think about why we are doing accounting, no. right? We're just doing accounting because our lecturer told us. But, but the, the reporting frameworks at their core are built on, on the reason why. Yeah. <laughs> and so if it's for profit, it's about measuring something and it's about who's going to use these financial statements. Yes. In, in private sector, you know, that's investors, it's people trying to work out the value of the company, should they buy yeah. or sell shares and yeah. so on. Um, in government, we don't care about that stuff. What we care about is whether the money was used for its intended purpose, 
right. uh, and and so it's, they're often used by you know the people that we elect into government who sit in parliament uh, and in legislatures around the country uh, and they are responsible for looking at these financial statements checking whether the money has been spent appropriately and then making future funding decisions yeah uh, because they decide right. how these different entities are going to get money from yeah. from the, the 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 fiscus the taxes that we pay yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> on an annual basis yeah. So that's the core of it. And when you yeah. then start going down to the detail, and I think we'll get maybe get some examples mm. just now, yeah. uh, then, then we, we start to see why, you know, actually the way this plays out, uh, if, the, if the reason why we're reporting is different, the way yes. it plays out uh, yes. at the end of the day is different. Yeah. Uh, the reason why government entities exist is different to the reason why yes. a private sector entity exists. So the financial yeah. statements oh. need, to, need to be produced yeah. in, a, in a slightly different way. Yeah. I think that's, I think it's, so valuable um, <clears throat> is and and as you say it's a it's a silent assumption that we don't really think about is that the 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 accounting standards are built on the basis of what is the entity intending to achieve like you know it needs to be measured according to you know what's being achieved and in the private sector we're used to saying it's about increasing shareholder value you know the net asset value and the equity value and you know creating profits so it's a good thing when your sales are bigger than your cost of sales you know that's like that's the objective is you know banking retained earnings giving dividends increasing shareholder value you know and that's the objective make money <laughs> whereas in the in the public sector it's have you used the money to give value to citizens? You know, have you used the money to create services, public services? So if your department or if your entity comes out of the end of the year with a profit, you know, that money that they haven't spent, that's not necessarily a good thing. <laughs> yeah. That's not actually really a good thing because yeah. you were given that money to provide water or hospitals or whatever to a bunch of people. And if, you've got money left over does that mean that you didn't do that because that's actually not a good thing so i think that it's it's a like a really visual or like a primary difference between the two of them and i think as you say we're not really aware of the fact that your accounting standards need to speak to that you know yeah. so measuring stuff according and as you say we're going to you know go through some examples to make that a little clearer so public sector standards ipsos um and they are international they are global they have their own board just like the IASB has its own board um, and the difference speaks to the basic objective, the basic objective difference, which is service delivery versus profits, which is very valuable. Very, very, very interesting. Um, so <clears throat> can you give us some examples of how, how IFRS would account for something differently or why it would be different. I mean, we're not going to go into like measurement and recognition or all that crap, but just like basically some, some on the ground examples of how it would, how something in the public sector would be completely different. You know, why IFRS doesn't work if, if you will yeah. in, in the public sector. Yeah. So, so yeah, maybe two examples. So, so the first one, if you think of, of a road, right? Yeah. Government, you want government to build a new road because it's going to contribute towards economic growth and so on. And let's just for argument's sake, assume that, it's, that this road won't be tolled, although we know in South Africa that tolling a ro road doesn't necessarily mean you get paid for the road. But let's just work on the assumption. <laughs> let's just work on the assumption that, that we are not going to earn any revenue from this road, right? We're going to build this road for the Public benefit needs the road, of the citizens. Right. Exactly, yep. exactly. Now, if you apply your IFRS standards, you know that an asset needs to result in, in, in economic benefits, Future right? economic benefits, uh, right. You want to see those future economic benefits. So, so there, are there any future economic benefits to the entity producing the financials? Well, no, not really, because they, if anything, it's going to actually cost them money because they're going to need to maintain the road. They're probably going to need to police the road because people will drive too fast. Yeah. And there's no income the coming in from that directly or indirectly. The, having exactly. the road doesn't create any economic value in the future. People exactly. are going to use it and abuse it and carry on and it's great, but there's zero money coming in. So it's Very possible that in the IFRS, depending on how you argue it, you might, you might recognize that asset on day one and then instantly impair it to zero because <laughs> there's no future economic benefit, right? What's, right. what's the point of that? Yeah. So, so under you can't Ipsa, sell it. Yeah, it's not like fair value. You can't sell yeah. it. There's no value in use. You don't get any value out of it. Okay, so exactly. Yeah. So all those technical IFRS <laughs> things, right? 
which because I'm in the public sector, I forget some of those these days. But fundamentally, it wouldn't work, right? Yeah. But now, now when we when we look at Ipsos, if we go to the way Ipsos defines uh, uh, an asset, uh, it'll sound somewhat familiar. They say an asset yeah. is a resource controlled by the entity as a result of a past event. Yeah. Um, and then they define a resource as an item with service potential right. or the ability to generate economic benefits. So you can see, first up, it's not actually about economic benefits. Yeah. It's about the potential that this asset has to deliver services to the citizen. Right. Yeah. So now, all of a sudden, hold on, that road is an asset because it has service potential. The citizens are going to yeah. use it to get about and, and to drive economic growth and so on. Yeah. So, so now, now we can recognize it as an asset. Um, and, and a similar th thing happens on the liability side yeah. in terms of, you know, out, outflow of resources, includes yeah. the outflow of service potential. Um, so it's just, a, it's just a simple example. And, and, and very often there's a lot of debate then about, because so, you know, was this thing an asset or was it a liability? Well, with a definition like that, it makes it clear that this thing is an asset. Yeah. There may be many commitments that government makes um, to, to maintain that road or, or yeah. to keep it safe and so on. And that's a different, different yeah. element of the accounting. But, uh, but at least with, with IPSAS, we now know, okay, this thing yeah. can actually be recognized yeah. and it does have a value, even though we'll never make any money out of it. Yeah, um, yeah. A, a second example, I'm going to call this idea of money for nothing. We all want money for nothing, right? But nobody yes. gets money for nothing except government. <laughs> <laughs> government has this mon monopoly, monopolistic right to charge taxes, right? To yeah. raise revenue it needs. Why? Because it wants to deliver services. Right. But here funny thing, you, you all are studying accounting, you hopefully going to be very rich one day pa paying lots of taxes. Um, that, <laughs> that, that, that 41% 40, that or higher tax yeah. rate that, that, that you dream yeah. of, you're going to get there, right? Um, yeah. What are you going to get in return for that? Um, yeah. Well, you should get services, but it's going to be impossible to tie the million rand in tax, yeah. taxes that you pay. Where's my million rand um, with the value, right? For that value, right? You, yeah. you might not even experience it. I mean, if you think about the, a developing country like South Africa, much of that would go towards uh, uh, the poor and those who don't, can't afford yep. to pay for education, can't afford, afford yeah. social welfare, and, uh, and, building yeah, exactly. and developments and yeah, yeah. roads so I'll never use. And, yeah. Exactly. So on the two sides, we've actually got two people getting money for nothing. <laughs> on the one side, we have government getting money for nothing. And then we've got people who, 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 who are unemployed, who are poor, who are getting something for nothing, right? They're yeah. not paying for those services necessarily. Yeah. And, and that's not wrong. That's, the, I mean, that's no, no, no. the way we develop a country, right? But now, if you are using IFRS and you that say, work. I'm going to pay you as government money, when would government recognize that income? Are they going to recognize it when... They deliver the services. Yeah, because in, in Everest, it's yeah, like you, it's like a crawl, right? You recognize yeah. the revenue as you've delivered the service. So therefore, my taxes, until you have given me a million rands worth of value for my taxes, it's income received in advance. Right, okay. which just doesn't work because you yeah. can't actually figure out when you delivered those services. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, so Ipsas then responds to that with, with entire standards dedicated to this idea of this thing called non-exchange revenue. Uh, and there's, there's some new stuff coming out soon around non-exchange expenses uh, and, and how you, you account for something that is received even though there's nothing that has to be given back. You see, most of what we would learn normally at university yeah. is exchange revenue exchange uh, expenses where yeah. where i pay you you give me something I, you pay me i give you something right it's yeah. not it, it's not this idea that that i give you money and when you feel like it you use it <laughs> yeah that's like a um, donation <laughs> exactly exactly <laughs> yeah. and, and so and so the ipsas will then respond to that and, and, and right. deal with how, how that works and when you might recognize that revenue when you might recognize an obligation on the other end because when that social grant when is there an obligation for government to pay it you know is it when government makes a promise is it when the politicians are campaigning and they promise they're going to pay everyone five thousand rand a month in social grants uh, is it when, when the poor, poor person's born exactly exactly and now that, that child that, is mom gets a grant for that person so do you recognize the liability when the baby's born yeah, and then are you going or to when present, are you going to present they, value the benefits until they die and or you know, get a job <laughs> and aren't on social welfare anymore? 
or is it yeah. when mom comes with a birth certificate to claim to actually claim yeah. the money so luckily there's been lots of debate that went into those types of questions and we have standards in fact if yeah. that's as a reasonably new social benefit standard that, that explains that and it's certainly not as complicated as that because it just wouldn't there's no value to going through those big exercises yeah um, but but the point is is that we've got this framework which is able to respond to unique differences or unique fundamental issues where we yeah. instead of being here about making profit we're here to deliver services uh, and that then has these implications that yeah. actually an asset can be an asset even yeah. though i'm not going to make money out of it yeah. but i'm going to use yeah. it for service delivery yeah. um, i can recognize revenue even though i haven't done anything for you yet yes um, and, and these are the types of some of the just examples of differences and this happened throughout the, the different elements of, of accounting that you would have taken for granted normally doing IFRS but but it's so important to be able to ask those questions yeah. why, why do we even yeah. account for it like this yeah. I think for me you know getting as a and we've you know we've, we've kind of had this discussion fairly tongue-in-cheek but I think it's it's amazing to get to um, a level in, in your profession as, you know, as someone, I like, I studied IFRS, obviously, and, uh, you know, I'm not even in corporate, I'm in education. So, so that's fine. I have no idea how this shit works. <laughs> you know, it's like, I had, you know, I had no idea. And it's so fascinating to have these discussions to just actually open the question of going, is benefits only economic? Cause that's what we as accountants understand. The value is economic. You know, if there's no economic value, if you can't sell it, if you can't, use it to create money or save money there's no value you know you can't you can't raise it because you can't make money save money or sell it you know whatever um so i think the fascinating thing to continually come back to the value is in service delivery the value is in service delivery the value is in service delivery and in a way it's like it breaks down the entire purpose of, of government as complicated and, and painful as it all is into your job is to provide services like your job is to yeah. provide services. Um, and I think that's obviously it's far more complicated than that, but I think that's really valuable to, for us to think about as, you know, as citizens or like as people, as professionals, it's like, where's the value? Yeah. yeah. It's not, it's not only in money. Um, it's also in, in the services, which is, which is quite, quite fascinating. So one maybe, of the maybe if I could just if I could yeah, just interrupt you there because I think yeah, it's a yeah. really important issue just to raise here. You know, for a lot of your students who, who are going to be going off, you, you guys are going, you know, off into into you know working as accountants. Yeah, many you might not go to the public sector, so you might have already oh, yeah. turned off. But don't think that these questions are not important to you, because there's a lot of a lot of discussion globally around you know even a private you know listed company. Um, why do they exist? Do they exist for profit? Mm. Or do they exist for this thing called sustainable development? What, what's the combination between that? And how might their um, reporting, both financial and otherwise, need to Reflect respond that. to the fact that actually that, you know, corporate citizens need to exist for more than just making money. For sure. Right. And I think it is, and we're going to discuss it a little bit more later, but I think that I really like that conversation because no companies that are out there, let's be honest, like, you know, Apple and, you know, all these like, you know, McDonald's and none of them out there are saying like, we exist to make money. You know, they don't, they don't advertise market, sell themselves, you know, when, when they put together their major corporate strategies and their major corporate objectives, nobody really is going like, Hey, we're here because we want your money. They all have these objectives of like, we're here to provide and innovate and disrupt and, like you know create and simplify and da, 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 da. so the question is like are you actually doing that or is that just a front like is it just a socially accepted front to like we want your money <laughs> you know so yeah i think i think it's, it's a really interesting question and um and again we'll get to that a little bit later when we discuss the conceptual framework because i think that's so fascinating so on the ground for someone who hasn't dealt with the public sector um, who are these reporting entities? So for me in the private sector, it's easy for me to say, oh, okay, so, you know, uh, the local grocery shop, you know, if that's a, that's a reporting entity, my local grocery shop will develop its set of financial statements. Uh, you know, the company down the road will develop its set of financial statements. The, you know, the, the educational company will provide. So we understand what reporting entities are. They're companies, they're businesses. What are reporting entities in the public sector? I mean, who is developing, who's using 
Ipsos and these you know, uh, accounting standards to create financials. Like, are we saying that your local police department is creating their set of financial statements, your local hospital or, you know, hospitals in the suburb or the town or the area or the province or the country? Like, who is the reporting entity? Who is creating these set of financial statements? So it, it, it really depends, to be honest, and it's not a simple sort of simple answer to, to say who, who would be those entities. It depends on the way governments have been established and, and the way the, the, the sort of structure of government works. So in, in some very centralized uh, uh, government structures, it, it could be that there is literally one reporting entity called government. <laughs> Um, because because they they could because everything is controlled centrally and yeah. they tell everyone down the food chain what to do um, wow. and and then you know th th basically you would submit your information but it ultimately gets consolidated into one set of yeah. financial yeah. Uh, one audit opinion for the auditors but that's that's oh, a, wow. that's that, that is an extreme situation yeah. like in other you know in the South African context context we're much more decentralized. Uh, so every municipality issues their own financials. Ah. Um, you wouldn't actually expect, a, a, say, you know, a, a, an individual police uh, uh, department to, to produce their own um, set of financials, but they will contribute towards a, you know, a, a set of financials for the police as a whole, uh, mm. or for, the, for the, you know, the ministry. And the department of police. So it 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 just depends, and it, it's complicated. Uh, you know, it's it's how these roll up and where it happens exactly yeah. is, is debatable. Uh, in with schools, for example, in South Africa, there's um, been some work that's been done by by SACA around creating a framework, especially for schools, oh. because for them to re report under IPSAS would just be way too complicated. Like they they don't have a they can't afford to have a CA in every school. It just doesn't mm. make sense. So, but, but they need a more simplified type of reporting, which ultimately mm. can be rolled up uh, into mm. the reporting higher up. Mm. So it, it, does, it does vary and it can depend, but generally speaking, you would expect uh, any standalone public entity uh, that exists to, to um, apply um, in South Africa GRAP or, or IPSAS uh, in, you know, globally, um, any, any department or ministry that kind of exists on its own, um, but 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 also just keep in mind that that it, a big question here is whether the entity the specific entity is actually about service delivery or if they kind of more have a business flavor to them. So if you think of like a, a electrical utility like ESCOM, mm. they uh, this again may surprise many people, but they actually are supposed to make money, right? They're supposed to be from <laughs> supposed to you know. And so for them, they actually account under IFRS, not under under GRAP or IPSAS. Um, so so there are some some, some differences you yeah. get uh, if if they they especially where you're getting more of an exchange, right? Again, you you pay ESCOM and they yeah supposed to, yeah right. Um, but but fu fundamentally, that that's where the shift can happen. Exactly where you define the entity, honestly, okay. it, it's a, it's a very it's yeah. a it's a question that the IPSAS conceptual framework deals with for pages and pages and pages. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Um, it's something that oh, you would kind of, yeah. largely, most accountants will just be told where the entity is. And yeah. <laughs> this, this, this is your, but, okay. Um, so, but it could go it's not far. like there are, it's not like your police department is a separate legal entity the way a business is. Yeah, no. no, no it doesn't no. have its own, like, yeah, okay. Yeah. So that, and again, it's a, as you said, it's an interesting question because, you know, it's like, who, who creates this? So it's not as, it's not as simple as it's a company and um, you know, um, yeah. so if I was a um, you know, normal accountant used to looking at accounting standards or accounting statements or financial statements that are drawn up on IFRS, would I be able to make sense of a set of financial statements that's drawn up on IFRS? Like, would I be able to make sense of this stuff? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I mean, the balance sheet and income statement look very similar. Some of the titles might be slightly different, yeah. um, but the, the, the structures are very similar. I think you know, probably the challenge for you as an accountant would be asking the question, why am I looking at these and what, what information mm. am I trying to get out of them? Mm. And the type of information you'd want to get out of a set of, of public sector financial statements is very different to what you'd yes. be wanting to get out of, out of the, you know, a, a listed company's um, financials yeah. that you're considering investing in. So, so, so that really comes down to the fundamental issue to say it's, a lot of it's about understanding the, the business that is being accounted for. Right. Um, if you want to, for example, take your expertise that you've learned at university uh, and now apply it in a job within government, 
uh, it's definitely possible that the, the, the transition would be not be difficult from a pure technical accounting perspective. The challenge is why are you even doing this? And can you understand yeah. the business that you're accounting right. for? Because that, that looks quite different. Ipsas, Ipsas itself and, and GRAP as well, uh, just, just to be clear, you know, GRAP is very, very similar to Ipsas. In fact, GRAP in some areas is ahead of Ipsas. Um, they, they've okay. charted some territory that haven't, hasn't quite been sorted out internationally yet. Um, but but for, for Ipsas and GRAP, they, they, they base their, their standards, you know, firstly on what is used in the, the private sector. So Ipsas okay. is always, its first port of call is, is there an IFRS standard that oh, deals okay. with this? Okay. Can we use it? Do we maybe need to tweak it here and there, change the terminology? You know, there's a certain extra disclosure we think is mm. required or, you know, mm. so they do that kind of work, more sort of panel beef the IFRS standard okay. rather than try and create a Start new from one. scratch, right. Then there's other areas where they would say, hold on, there's an area like social benefits or non-exchange revenue mm. or heritage assets uh, where they would say, wait, there's nothing in nothing. IFRS that really responds to this issue properly. So we need to create a new standard. So if you've learned IFRS, you've at least learned the mechanics of accounting, mm. you understand double entry, mm. you broadly understand, mm. um, you know, initial recognition and subsequent measurement and all those nice things. All of that stuff is there. It's the same mm. type of structure. Um, but there's certain, it would take you a while just to get yourself up to speed on, on some of the unique elements. Mm. Um, but it's not terribly different. Again, mm. what is different is the thing you are accounting for. Yeah. That's where it would be harder to transition. Not impossible, but it's just about saying, uh, yes, I need to go on a special IPSAS course to learn how IPSAS works, but also need to probably learn about public financial management yeah. and the way, the way government structure and the way yes. government operates because yeah. that's quite different. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. and that could be probably the harder element. Yeah. Of that. But I think there's, there's a lot of value in, in that discussion, or, you know, even if you never plan on touching the public sector, that's fine. But I think mm -hmm. for me, what this raises is, as an accountant, do you actually think about the organization, the company, the, the industry, the assets. I think we're so used to saying uh, a machine is an asset, property is an asset, you know, PPE, property plants, those are assets. Like we know, like this is an asset, that's an asset. We don't think about it. We don't mm. actually ask the question. We're like, okay, that's an asset. Whereas, um, you know, like you're saying, what you need to do here is really sit down and get to understand the shape of the business, the shape of what actually happens, what your intentions are, what the objective is. And in, in reality, as an accountant, that is what you need to be doing when you go into any organization. You know, the, the, the accounting needs to serve the organization, not vice versa. The organization doesn't exist to create financial statements. <laughs> you know, so I think yeah. to some extent when, we, when we're studying accounting at such a level, we're not actually studying business. Like, yeah, we kind of have a little bit of a misconception that because we're accountants, we can, you know, we're great business people. That's necessarily true. We still have a lot of level to understand, like, what is the purpose of the business? What's it here for? How is it structured? How does it work? What's the operations? And how does the accounting serve that, speak to that, and then translate all of that into what IFRS requires? But IFRS is not, IFRS is not the objective. You know, the objective is, is preparing a set of financial statements. No, the objective is whatever the objective of the company is. And, and by the way, the company has to create financial statements. Like, yeah. you know. So I think that's, that's a valuable, you know, that's a valuable discussion regardless of, of where you find yourself is like, are you actually spending time understanding what on earth is going on on a daily basis? <laughs> okay. and, and this, and this is, I mean, this is such an important issue you raise, particularly in the South African context, because we've, in the public sector, we've developed something of a culture of, um, preparing financial statements to get clean audits um, instead of preparing financial statements as a tool that can be used to drive accountability and decision making. Right. Um, instead of using uh, uh, the financial statement as a tool, it's become like an end in itself. Mm. And, accountants are, and accountants are to blame for a lot of this. Uh, there, there are lots of um, professional accountants, I won't say which profession, but a lot of professional accountants <laughs> who help um, professional accountants is not is is is, is you know include CAs. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I understand. Yeah. Just for those who, who know this world a little bit, but the 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 there are plenty of professional accountants who make a lot of money about how, out of helping municipalities to get clean audits by preparing their financials. Yeah. But they don't understand the business. They don't understand mm -hmm. why the municipality exists. They don't understand that maybe spending a large portion of your budget just trying to get the financials right is not a good use of money. 
uh, and that as an accountant, you might have an obligation to say, you know, maybe we can, you know, help you to do this yourself better. Mm. Uh, maybe we can transfer some of the skills we have to you mm. uh, and rather help you in ensuring that your financial management and practices is supporting your ultimate objective of delivering services. Uh, and this is a really important issue. It's very easy to make money out of, out of government where they might not be so good at the technical accounting. Yeah. Because, because this, this, this whole world of accounting is quite new for government. Uh, the, the, I mentioned the modified cash basis yes. earlier. Um, you know, a lot of governments globally have, have functioned on a cash basis of accounting for centuries. That's just been the way it's been done. Yeah. Um, for good or for bad. But, but there's a big move globally at the moment towards introducing um, accrual accounting and in particular IPSAS standards. Uh, and, and accountants need to be a part of that. Mm. They need to be a part of that, not just for the sake of making money, but for the sake of actually helping to ensure that money is better managed, that assets are better yeah. managed, that, yeah. we, that we don't over-indebt ourselves, you know, um, and so on. Under the current circumstances, there's lots of questions around, you know, COVID-19 now and how that's going to impact on, you know, public debt. Yeah, uh, yeah, and accountants can play a role in making sure that we at least get that information out there about what those real numbers are going to be, yeah. what the implications of that are going to be yeah. Um, yeah. for future generations. So that's yeah. the role of the accountant in the public sector, not, as you say, just to produce uh, uh, yeah. IPSAS standards as though that was IPSAS financial statements as though that was the objective of the business. Yes. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Okay. So if we come to you know accounting and auditing, I suppose. Um, we understand that uh, financial statements are used to make decisions about stuff. And we understand what those decisions are. Like we understand who the users are and what's going on in the, yeah. in the private sector in terms of potential investors wanting to invest in the company. So they look at the financial statements, uh, you know, giving finance to a company, understanding what the profits are. Um, you know, so we, we kind of understand what financial statements are predominantly used for in the private sector. What are these financial statements actually used for in the public sector? Who are the users and what, what is done with them? And then, you know, okay, so, so the financial statements are audited in, in South Africa by the Auditor General, right? So the financial statements are audited, they get clean or not clean, <laughs> audit reports, and then what? Like, yeah. who's using the stuff and what is it used for? Yeah. So, I mean, I mean, I think the first thing to note is that because many of these, these uh, sort of full accrual financial statements are, are quite complex and quite new to a lot of people, they probably aren't being used in the way we'd like them to be used yet, but that, right. that's part of a journey. So let me rather sort of paint the ideal picture of right. where we can yeah. get. And the first thing is to say that everyone can use the financial statements. Any citizen who pays taxes, any citizen who receives services could look at the financial statements to be able to ask questions of their political leadership, right? Um, in reality, that's probably not going to happen that much. Well, so I think be... I've, I've looked at the stuff. <laughs> and first of all, you know, <clears throat> some of those numbers <laughs> <laughs> under some of those columns, especially the columns called reckless and what are they call it? Reckless and wasteful expenditure? Yeah, like yeah fruit, fruitless and wasteful. Fruitless, yeah. yeah fruitless and wasteful. <clears throat> and then some of the material irregularities or like yeah. those are a little scary, but really, I mean, fascinating, but also a little nauseating. Um, yeah. So, so I've, I've, I've looked at those audit reports and like the financials, which is really interesting. What I do with that information, I'm not really sure, but that's not really a discussion yeah. for, for, for right now. So like you say, ideally citizens can use it. You can see it. I'm going to put a link in to, to them in, in the post so that, people can actually go, okay, this is where they are and this is yeah. where you find them out of interest, which is cool. Yeah. Um, so ideally now, who's using these and like for what? What's actually happening yeah. with them? So, so as a citizen, you vote uh, and certainly the financial statements can help you maybe when you decide to vote, but, <laughs> but, but, but that's about the only opportunity you really have to have a clear say unless you want to go protest on the street or something like that. But, but fundamentally, you vote for... Um, yeah. Uh, your, your representatives. So for people who are going to sit in parliament, who are going to sit on, in, in your provincial legislature or are going to sit in your municipal council. Uh, and those people um, are the ones who, who are required to scrutinize these financial statements. So it's not usually all of them. Usually there's a small group of them. So for mm. example, in parliament, we have something called the Standing Committee on Public Accounts. So it's a subcommittee of parliament, generally with the people who have more of a uh, accounting or finance background. 
uh, and they would rep they're representative of all the different political parties who, who are in, in parliament. Uh, and they are, are required to look at the, these, these statements and then ask the difficult questions of the minister in charge of the respective departments or, or the, the, you know, the accounting officer, the person who has ultimate responsibility for managing the finances. And this can be a very difficult process. So these guys have to come and literally sit before these committees and they get oh, wow. drilled on, you know, why is there so much fruitless and wasteful expenditure? Why is there irregular expenditure? Um, why did you not spend your budget? Why did you overspend on your budget? Um, we're not seeing service delivery, and yet you say you're spending the money. So how does these two things link? So, so those are the, that's the primary kind of users, is, is the elected right. officials. Yeah. We often think we vote people into government to deliver us services. But no, we vote people into government to govern the civil service. Mm. The civil service, which is full-time people, are the ones who deliver the services to us, mm. right? So mm. it's the people, so the people you vote in are the ones you're actually saying, please go and make sure that my taxpayers' money is used appropriately. Mm. Uh, and mm. that's, that's, the, that's sort of the fundamental issue there. So, mm. of course, though, on top of that, you'll get other people who will use them. So civil society, uh, the, the people who we don't vote in, but who, who are our voice uh, to challenge some mm. of the things that government does that we don't like, mm. uh, or, or, you know, problems we've got with service delivery. Civil society is able to use it and to, to mm. ask difficult questions mm. in the public space. Media is able to use it. Um, uh, uh, even, but predominantly, even, I mean, if we, I'm just like trying to draw a parallel mm. to a world we understand, predominantly, it's almost like saying the primary users are like your, di like your directors of the company who's asking management, exactly. what did you do this year? Like, why did you do that? Um, exactly. And we're, I'm not going to say shareholders because like, you know, yeah. there's no owners, if you will, but it's basically like saying there are really high level directors that are saying to the people who are doing stuff on a daily basis and making decisions like your management like how did you spend the money where's this going what did you do so it's it's you know one of the words that keeps popping up is it's it's predominantly used or should ideally predominantly be used to hold people and and government entities accountable for the way that they're spending taxpayers money the way that they're delivering the way that they're delivering services. So unlike, I think, the private sector where predominantly the users are expected to be external, banks, mm -hmm. finance houses, potential investors, shareholders who have nothing to do with the business on a daily basis, if you will, those are kind of like, we don't really see the directors as users of the financial statements yeah. in the private sector. We're like, well, you were part of the people that created them. You should know what the hell's going on there. If you don't trust your own stuff, then... <laughs> That's the problem. <laughs> Whereas yeah. this is like the predominant use is like, okay, I've got these audited financials. Now let's see, like, what does this mean for the organization? What should you change? Yeah. What have you done? What have you not done? What's happened? Which I think is quite interesting because it's quite a shift from creating financials for someone else versus creating yeah. financials for ourselves to go, okay, what really happened here? Like, yeah. Really yeah. Happened? I don't know. So that, that, are, that I find like, the, and I, I find that really interesting and again speaks to the objective of like our objective is to deliver services and you know serve the public etc cetera, etc cetera. so the financials are our basis of using that and saying so how did this go <laughs> yeah <laughs> and that's and that's it yeah so i mean i would i would say that there's also some elements of the shareholder there as well though so so yes from a governance perspective in the sense there's a person who's holding you accountable for what mm. you've done or not done or how you spent mm. money or not spent money um that that's that's uh, you know sort of sounds similar to a director um but those people also sit in the in parliament and make funding decisions right. so they decide how much each of these different departments for right. example, is going to get in the next year uh, and so when they have an appreciation for, you know, through the financial statements for, you know, maybe, maybe where uh, it turns out things actually cost a lot more than we had, had thought in previously yeah. in the financials, kind of give me yeah. that information. Well, yeah. then I can make sure that I, I try to allocate more money mm. to that particular party mm. in future years. Mm. It's only one of many factors that come into it, but, but, but certainly the hope, my hope in, in, in the future is that financial statements will play a much bigger role in influencing those decisions yeah. from the bottom up. Where yeah. it really becomes said, this is the picture that we have on the ground, um, yeah. and this means, you know, it, this is part of us justifying why we need more money, yeah. or, or why money should be maybe reallocated somewhere else, and, and so on. Yeah, yeah. So, um, leading on, leading on from that, um, 
I, I found it really interesting to read the conceptual framework, to read Ipsos, you know, the conceptual framework of Ipsos. Now, I know <clears throat> as a lecturer, <laughs> most <laughs> students learn the conceptual framework. Obviously, most, you know, everyone's, most people are learning Ipsos, right? But they learn the conceptual framework as a theory thing. You know, he has a list of yeah. like, fine. Um, and I don't really think that people are super comfortable with what on earth the conceptual framework is supposed to be doing. So I'm not, I'm not really going to go into all of that. I'm not going to go into too much of that stuff. But suffice to say, I found it really interesting fundamentally the differences or the difference between the conceptual framework in IFRS and the conceptual framework in, in EPSIS. So um, do you want to talk us through on a fairly basic level what that fundamental difference is? And we can discuss why I found it so fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the, so, sorry, just to clarify, um, the, the difference between the, the, the two conceptual frameworks? Or the yeah. Different yeah. 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 So, so, so the, um, yeah, I, from an Ipsos perspective, I think there's, there's a couple of unique elements. Um, one is just the scope of what financial reporting actually is. Mm. So Ipsos speaks about this concept of GPFR, general purpose financial report. Yeah. Which are not just financial reports. And, and it makes it very clear up front that yes, it may include historical financial information, but it may also include uh, information about service deliveries. Mm -hmm. So what we sometimes call performance information, you know, how many houses did you build? Mm -hmm. uh, how many mm -hmm. roads did you build and things like mm -hmm. that. Uh, it may also include uh, uh, future projections. So it could be that we, we are trying to work out how much we're gonna spend in the future or mm -hmm. what the impact of our spending is gonna mm -hmm. be and how that might affect our sort of uh, uh, fiscal sustainability and so on. Um, it, it can also include future plans for service delivery as well. So it, it, it gives, a, it immediately paints the scope of general purpose financial reporting much broader yeah. than what you might expect in a normal yeah. IFRS environment. Yeah. Um, it, then, it then really emphasizes this idea that, that, that the objective of financial reporting is for both accountability and, and uh, um, decision-making purposes. Mm. I know this is a big debate even in IFRS about whether it should be both or whether it's just decision-making, but, but it's very clear in the public sector. It's about accountability. Mm. We, the objective of this is for accountability purposes and for decision-making purposes. Right. So yeah. both the decisions about when we need to hold someone accountable because they wasted our money, mm. as well as the decision about how much money is going to be given in the, in the yeah. future or how we might reprioritize yeah. our spending, right? Yeah. And then, then as you go down in, into the depths, you start to see how it's, it, it addresses um, a, a number of, of, of issues that are particularly unique in the public sector. Mm. So the issue about what is a reporting entity, a mm. lot of discussion about that. Uh, the issue about what is an asset, what is a liability, mm. um, and this idea that it's not just about economic benefits, mm. but it's also about service potential, right? Mm. Um, so at the core, those are, those are the kind of the main, I think the main areas where you'll see some differences. You know, if you mm -hmm. do a side by side on the qualitative characteristics, there, there, there are some differences here and there. Yeah. Um, but they're very, you know, when, as you say, side by side, there's a lot of similarities. You're like, you know, transparency, yeah, you're yeah. finding both. And I think we, the idea of transparency in the public sector is just so much more important because they're using other people's money. <laughs> you know, exactly. like, so, you know, there's, there's, when you look at them side by side, there's a lot of like, okay, tick, 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 tick. But I think, you know, the context, um, the context in them is just, is quite different. Um, but exactly as you're saying, like, I just, I found it so fascinating and, and, and really interesting that, you know, in the conceptual framework for the, accounting standards you know so what we're used to is saying okay the accounting standards create statements of financial position statement of profit or loss statement of ch changes in equity cash flow like those are you know your numbers like the numbers about the money yeah. kind of thing that is what the conceptual framework speaks to you know tell us yeah. about the money and in Ipsos, i find it really fascinating that right up front in the conceptual framework it's going telling us about the money is not enough yeah. you know like telling us about the, the financial position and the financial performance is actually not enough to, to meet the requirements of what we need to do, to meet accountability and to meet decision-making. Exactly as you say, um, we also need information about the performance. We need information about the service delivery in order to create a proper picture. Yeah, yeah. Which I think is so fascinating because it all the way comes back to the objective of the public sector, 
you know, that entity is to provide services. So in order to measure whether or not you've met your objective, um, we can't do that without actually looking at what you've done as well as the numbers. Whereas, yeah. you know, and, and taking that over into the private sector, and I'm certainly not having like a big accounting debate here, but, but I just, I have to question whether or not that's not, it's like, it's kind of fairly obvious. You know, if you're running a company and your objective is to, you know, whatever your objective is, then, then surely part of your presentations or part of like what you're showing should be like, so what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> like so what what do you actually do on a daily basis like are you meeting your objective you know if you say your intention is to you know provide everyone with a laptop like i don't know what you know then like have you actually done that you know if your objective yeah. is to give really great internet service like have you actually done that you know, the, the mm. fact that we can look at a set of financial statements and assess a company on the basis of their figures alone without actually going so what is what was this company actually designed to do but I think it, you know, for me, it was quite, and again, we, we talk about ideal mm -hmm. and then we can all get very cynical about the reality of life and all that crap. But, but I just, I found that so fascinating, if, if nothing else, just that, that one recognition in Epsis that the numbers alone are not enough. Like you yeah. can't, to get a picture of what's going on, you can't just look at the numbers. Yeah. yeah. You know, which I think is, yeah. is so fascinating. And again, um, you know, looking at the stuff like public sector's got, financial statements audits, great, but huge focus on performance audits, mm -hmm. you know, which we doesn't, you know, doesn't really exist in, you know, in the, in the private sector, the idea of like, and I mean, there's, there's actual audit standards around performance audits, like here's how to do a performance audit, whatever that performance may be looking at. I think that's really fascinating. Not only is like super yeah. valuable for management and, you know, like what's actually going on, how are the management and people, those charged with governance, how are they actually performing? Like what's going on? So, yeah, I think, as I say, like forget, you know, all the technical details about the conceptual framework and everything. I just thought it was really fascinating the actual, mm. you know, that, um, the recognition of how important it is to look at the objective of the organization mm. that does the information we're creating, does it actually tell you what's happening and how we're doing as far as our, as far as our objective is concerned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's it. I mean, at the end of the day, the, the conceptual framework is really what tells you kind of firstly why you're even reporting in the first place. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and again, this is, you know, it comes down to, we don't do financial statements because accountants created a profession that, and are creating work for themselves, right? <laughs> we do it because there's, there's, there's an overall purpose that we're trying to serve you. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah I like that, yeah. That, right? they, they, they help you to understand that why. Like, why do we do it? Well, we do it because we want to give information that's useful for decision-making purposes and for accountability purposes. Yeah. Um, and that's the broad objective, right? So, okay, let's, let's start drilling down into what that means within the particular sector yeah. that we're in. Yeah. Uh, and and, and, and it, it does, you know, conceptual framework really helps you to understand that, that you know, why, uh, as, they, as well as then just to watch, you know, so what, so, okay, fine, this is why I'm doing it. So what do I need to achieve those objectives? Mm. Well, I need to tell them about my assets and my liabilities and my mm. income and expenses. And, uh, oh, but actually I also need to tell them about my performance information because I'm in the mm. public sector. Mm. And I need to tell them about my future plans because, they actually are probably more interested in that right now than, yep. than just gone before. And so it's, it, it's, it's these kinds of elements. And of course, yeah. later on, you get into your standards that will give you much more of a sort of clarity in terms of, you know, exactly how you go. Yeah. Preparing yeah. I really so, like the way that you put that is the conceptual framework is about the why, like why are we doing this and, you know, what do we need to achieve? And then the standards themselves pick up the, how do you do this? You know, and I think yeah. it's easy when you're studying stuff to see all of this as side by side. You know, we've got the conceptual framework and we've got, you know, the, the standard and the standard and they're all like on the same level, you know. And um, we, most, most students spend more time studying the standards than they do the conceptual framework. The, you know, understanding that the conceptual framework is, is the base, like this is why and what we're trying to do. And then, you know, the standards are built out of that to go, okay, there's a specific issue here that let's help you apply the conceptual framework to how this particular thing works. Yeah. You know, that was the conceptual framework, but now like when you look at this, how exactly does this work? So, you know, um, you know, big topical issue like cryptocurrency, what the hell do we do with it? You know, it's totally new, nobody's touched it before. So 
theoretically, we should be going to the conceptual framework and be like, what do we do with this? You know, but now yeah. chances are in the next couple of years, we may end up finding we've got a standard on cryptocurrency. <laughs> Cause yeah. like, yeah. Okay, just give you some, like, let's tell you how to do that. Um, so, so yeah, I think it's, um, the, you know, for me, looking at them side by side, I found it quite fascinating in terms of one of the fundamental differences between Epsis and, and Ephorus was just mm. the recognition that numbers are not enough. And I think for, for classic accountants, that's worth remembering. You know, you can't yeah. actually give a full picture of what's going on with just the numbers. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, I mean, it's, even, it, it's, so, it's so interesting. If you, actually, if you actually read the conceptual frameworks with this in mind, so you, know, mm -hmm. if you, you mm -hmm. think, okay, wait, how is this telling me about the why? You know, I would imagine for most, for most students, when you're studying, what you're doing is you're saying, okay, how does this conceptual framework influence the way the financial statements are going to look, right? Yeah. Or, or yeah. what's going to be an asset or, or the way I'm going to report. Yeah. But you know, if you think of something like qualitative characteristics, mm. um, like in, in Epitaph, we have relevance and faithful representation. Mm. That is not so much about, about, you know, just for the sake of the way the financials are going to look. It, it tells you why we're doing it. Mm. We're preparing financial statements so that they can speak to the users and the context in which they are. So mm. they must be relevant. Mm. That's, that's, a, that's a why. You know, they must mm. faithfully represent because if they don't faithfully represent, we can't achieve the purpose of financial reporting. Yeah. It's yeah. comparable. Otherwise, how do we how do we use this? How do we compare? Yeah. You know, two entities side yeah. by side and so on. Yeah. So if if you start thinking about it, like wh what is the reason why I'm doing this financial mm. report? And suddenly it'll change your decision making mm. the way you do things. It might not change your answer to a theory question at university. <laughs> Probably not. World, <laughs> world, it will it will make you think more carefully about the way you 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 account and the way you present things. Um, so I think we'll I think we'll end there for 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 the day. I think we've um, explored quite quite a lot of stuff. Um, any last words that you that that you want to say for people studying working with accounting as far as um, all of this stuff is concerned? Yeah. So I, I really would encourage students to to always be thinking about why I'm doing what I'm doing. How are these skills that I'm learning going to help? Um, it just so happens in the public sector that sometimes it's a bit easier to understand and see and see the value that you add. Um, but really understanding that and how you might be somewhat of a change agent around the way mm. the accounting profession, um, particularly through financial reporting, is able to add value. You know, we speak mm. a lot in the profession now about the fact that it's not just about producing numbers, but it's about producing value and how we mm. add value to organizations. Um, and, you know, for me, a big passion of mine is, is, is this idea of sustainable development. You know, how, whether you're a corporate citizen, a co you know, a company, or whether you are, yeah. are a part of government or wherever you are, how are you making a difference in your country? How are you, mm. you know, co you're contributing to ensure that, 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 that we have a sustainable future, that, you know, mm. we're not destroying the environment, that we, mm. that we are reducing inequality, that we're dealing with issues like that. Mm. You start, when you start framing your studies in that, in that context and understanding, hold on, the work I'm doing is actually something that can add value. Mm. Um, and really, right now, we can see it. In, in, in the, there's so much discussion around how accountants might, might be able to um, uh, support yeah. COVID-19 relief efforts and such. You know, um, what, how might financial reporting change under these circumstances? Is, are, are, are my accounting standards the most important? Or is the most important that we get through this and that mm. the money is spent in a way that's going to be impactful? Yeah. Uh, and the people who waste it get held accountable. Yeah. And how might your role as an accountant play out in that? And so, yeah. you know, we speak so much about the role doctors have to play, but accountants yeah. are so critical to making sure that money is channeled correctly, it's used correctly, is accounted for correctly, and, and uh, uh, that ultimately people are held responsible if they wasted it. Um, yeah. So that's the type of value you can add. Uh, that's what your studies can do. So, so really mm. just encourage the guys, even when you're doing technical accounting topics, always ask why, what, what if, how could I use the skill? Mm. Um, to, to actually, you know, add value to, to my community. Mm. Um, so yeah, I would really challenge students on that. Awesome. Again, I uh, always enjoy talking to you. And um, again, this is probably not going to be the last discussion that, that, that we have. Um, so thank you. Thank you very much for, for your time. And I will add uh, a bunch of links. And if there are any other links that you want to add, that you want people to go and, and, and check out, feel free to, to send them and add them. Um, but yeah, failing that, thanks very much. Um, and enjoy the rest of your lockdown period. <laughs>
<laughs> thank you, thank you. Awesome. Nice to you. <laughs> uh, cool. Okay, so there we go. Stop recording. So